If the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel say, if the Lord had not been on our side when people attacked us, they would have swallowed us alive when their anger flared against us. The flood would have engulfed us. The torrent would have swept over us. The raging waters would have swept us away. Praise be to the Lord, who has not let us be torn by their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the fowler's snare. The snare has been broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And the second reading is John chapter 18, verses 1 to 14, which is on page 1086 of the Church Bibles. That's John chapter 18, starting at verse 1. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Jesus, Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas, the traitor, was standing there with them. When Jesus, Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the... the and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, Put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. Thank you, Becca. Do keep that second reading in John chapter 18 open, uh, if you would. I want to speak to you this morning about what a wonderful saviour Jesus is. And I want to speak to you particularly for those times in our lives when it feels that we are surrounded by darkness, when darkness keep, comes knocking on the door. And it may be that you, like many of us, are deeply troubled by what's happening elsewhere in Europe at the moment, and it feels so dark, and you read the news feeds, and you look at video clips on the news, and it's so dark, and it feels oppressively dark, and it feels that there's no way out. I've been uh, Zooming recently with a friend who's a Belarusian, who's a refugee, he's a pastor, he's a refugee in Poland, another who's a uh, a Slovakian, he's a pastor in Bratislava, helping to deal with refugees there and care for them. And it makes you feel very close, the darkness of, of our world. Or it may be other kinds of darkness. It may be a darkness brought on by something in your mental health or something in your family, relationships with teenagers, with elderly parents, a difficult marriage, a difficult friendship, something that just makes you feel, you wake up in the morning and it feels dark and you feel that there's no way out. It may be financial troubles. It may be the sort of demons in your own heart, some habit or addiction that's destroying you, a habit of anger or resentment or grumbling or lust or greed or something. And it just feels very dark. Now, of course, you may not feel like that. This may be a very bright day for you, in which case, thank God for that. But you still need to listen, because these dark days happen, and they happen to the Church of Christ. And when they happen, we need to know what kind of saviour Jesus is. In our psalm, we heard the people of God saying, we've escaped, a narrow escape from some danger. We've escaped, we've escaped. You get that twice in 
the psalm. And I want you, if you will, to come with me in your mind's eye to the story of a great escape. Verse 1 of John chapter 18, when he had finished praying, he'd finished speaking these words. If you look back later at John chapter 13, it's that same evening, and Jesus is speaking words with his disciples, the twelve. And partway through chapter 13, Judas Iscariot, who's going to betray him, leaves, and John comments, it was night. There's a darkness surrounding what's happening, and Judas goes out into the night. And then Jesus speaks to the remaining 11 through chapters 14, 15, 16, and then in chapter 17 he prays for them and for others who will believe their message in the years and the centuries ahead. And it's really important, I think, for you and, uh, and for me. If you belong to Jesus, you and I are not spectators of the drama we're going to see. It's a very dramatic little story. But we're not simply spectators. The Bible would say, if you are a disciple of Jesus, if I'm a disciple of Jesus, then we are there. This is our story. You get this in the Old Testament where Moses says to people who weren't there at Mount Sinai, God made a covenant with us. You were there. And in, in a similar sort of way, you were there uh, if you're a follower of Jesus. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you're so welcome uh, to be a spectator. But you may decide by the end that actually you want to be part of it. You want this to be your story. So we begin the story in verse 1. When Jesus had finished speaking these words, he, he leaves, leaves the city of Jerusalem with his disciples. So with the eleven, the twelve, but with Judas Iscariot having left, with the eleven. And he crosses the Kidron Valley. That's a little uh, valley between Jerusalem and the, the Mount of Olives. And it has a, a, a brook Kidron or a wadi that, 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 that flows in the, the wet months of the year, and they crossed there. And on the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Notice, twice already John has said, Jesus, and his disciples. Just in case you're in any danger of thinking this is just Jesus, John says twice. He's going to say it a third time in a moment. And his disciples. So if you're a disciple, you're a follower of Jesus, you're there with those 11, as Jesus leads you into a garden. And the first thing I want us to notice is that an extraordinary thing that Jesus deliberately takes his church, his disciples, his church in embryo, he takes them into a place of great danger. Uh, John says they went, he, he left with his disciples and he went into the garden. And the language suggests that the garden is in some way enclosed, maybe walled. It's a garden that you go into, and once you're in it, you may not get out. You go into this garden. He takes them into the garden. And it gets worse because verse 2, Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. <laughs> So if you're in any danger of forgetting that this is about the disciples with Jesus, John has now said this to us three times. And he leads them there, and he, he leads them there knowing that this is their regular rendezvous. They've been there many times together. Judas has been there with them on past occasions. Judas knows the place. Jesus knows that Judas knows the place. And Jesus knows, as is clear from chapter 13, that Judas is going to betray him. So he leads them into there. One old writer, John Chrysostom, in the fourth century said that Jesus places himself in the garden as in a prison. He deliberately walks in there with the eleven. There they are in this place of great danger. It's a place of great danger. Jesus is hunted. You read through John's Gospel, he's been hunted ever since chapter 5. You see him being hunted in chapter 5, in chapter 7, in chapter 8, in chapter 10, in chapter 11. And in chapter 11, we're told that the order has gone out that anybody who knows where Jesus is has got to inform the authorities. So the disciples, the 11, by simply by virtue of the fact that they're there with him and they know where he is and they haven't informed the, the, the authorities, they are guilty men in the eyes of the law. 
So it's a place of great danger. And Judas comes there. The other Gospels tell us what happens in the garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. And John, I think, assumes that his readers know that. And he cuts straight to the end uh, where Judas comes in verse 3. He comes to the garden guiding a detachment of soldiers. And the word for detachment means a, a cohort. At full strength, that was 600 Roman soldiers. Now, even if not all 600 came, that, that, that's probably the, the cohort that was on duty in the, the Antonia Fortress at the time of the Jewish Passover. It was a, a time of, of excitement and, and a bit of a danger time if you were in charge of security. So they had a cohort there. And we don't know if they sent all 600 here, but the Romans certainly understood the concept of overwhelming force. In Acts chapter 23, um, we, we read of an occasion in which the Roman authorities uh, deputed near just under 500 armed men to guard one prisoner. So they understood the concept of overwhelming force, and they've sent here overwhelming force. Of course, they don't know what they're going to find they don't know they're going to find Jesus with just 11 men. They don't know what they're going to find. So they send uh, some or all of a cohort. And, um, uh, 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 and, and then there's some others from the Jewish authorities as well. But the Romans will have been the better armed ones. And they're carrying torches and lanterns because they're men of darkness, acting in darkness and weapons. And you picture yourself there as darkness comes knocking on the door. Your master has led you into this enclosed garden. And you can hear the boots and the weapons and the, 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 the clanking and the noises of an overwhelming force coming in the darkness with their torches. And you're trapped in the garden with your master. And so the question arises, why has Jesus done that? Because it's obvious that he, he knows, that Judas knows the place. He knows that Judas is going to betray him, and yet he deliberately goes in there, and he goes in there with his disciples. And the next thing that happens in verses 4 through to 9 is equally surprising. Do you know what the surprise is in, chapter, in verses 4 to 9? The surprise is that only one man gets arrested if you were in charge of the cohort, all the, 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 the armed uh, soldiers and others who'd come, and you've been sent out to arrest Jesus of Nazareth because there's a suspicion of some sort of um, rebel movement or some trouble, and you find him with a group of his followers, what do you do? This is not a lesson in advanced military um, knowledge. What do you do? Do you just arrest the leader? Of course you don't. You arrest them all. Uh, later on in next week's passage, we'll see that when Jesus was questioned in his trial, they questioned him about his disciples. What sort of movement is this? They're, and they're, they're, they're in great danger. But let's watch and see what happens. What kind of leader is he when darkness comes calling? It's a very dramatic scene. Jesus, knowing all that's going to happen to him, Jesus in control. It's the, one of the paradoxes here that John draws out that Jesus is in control. He knows what's going to happen to him and he goes out. So there they are in the garden and Jesus leaves the others and he goes out of the garden to meet this overwhelming force of soldiers and officials and others. And he asks them, this extraordinarily dramatic meeting of one man with a large group of soldiers. And he goes out and he says, who is it you want? Who do you seek? Who are you looking for? Jesus has been sought again and again and again in John's gospel. They've been looking for him. They've been trying to destroy him, trying to arrest him. You read through John's gospel and indeed the other gospels and you'll see that, that much of the story of his public life was, was the story of being a marked man and sought and looked for. Who are you looking for? And the irony is that they only find him when he goes out and he says, who are you looking for? And he stands there on behalf 
of his disciples. Who do you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I don't know how much they knew about Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth was a an unimportant place up in the north of the country. Probably many of them had never been there. Um, but that's, that's the name we've been given, Jesus of Nazareth. That's who we've been told to come for. I am he, Jesus said. Literally, I am. And there's something about the way he says, I am. At one level, it just means, yeah, that's me. But there's something about the way he says, I am that causes consternation in this large, overwhelming force of armed soldiers and, and, and others. I am. Perhaps even an echo of the way God himself describes himself in the Old Testament. I am who I am. And Jesus says, I am. And then John just comments, it's in brackets in our translation, but John just comments, Judas the traitor. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing there with them. You read through the four Gospels looking for references to Judas Iscariot. It's a great tragedy. And again and again and again in the Gospels, he's simply described as Judas, who betrayed him. It's the only thing they're going to put on his gravestone, Judas, who betrayed him. I'm sure Judas did and said other things, there were other things in Judas Iscariot's life, but the one thing he's remembered for is that he betrayed his master. And he is standing there with them. We're going to see in next week's passage how important it is where you stand. He is standing with them. We use that expression, don't we? You know, Martin Luther at the Reformation supposed to have said, Here I stand. This is where I stand. This is my standpoint. And Judas Iscariot now stands with the men of darkness who've come to arrest the Lord Jesus. In his heart, he's been there for some time. We discover, you read elsewhere in John's Gospel in chapter 12, you discover that Judas was the treasurer and he's begun stealing money from their common uh, purse. So he's begun to be obsessed by greed and it's beginning to destroy him. So in his heart, he stood with the enemies of Jesus, with the people of darkness for some time. But now he stands there where his heart has stood for some time. It's a terrible little comment. And of course, if we had time, we could have much, say much more about Judas. But it's not the main thrust here. So you see Judas standing there and the other 11 cowering, I imagine, frightened in the darkness with, Judah, with Jesus standing at the front. And then you get it again. And they ask him again, and Jesus says again, who, 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 who do you want? And, and when he says this, we read that they drew back and fell to the ground. Must have been an extraordinary scene. I expect if you'd been there in history, you would never have forgotten this overwhelming force of Roman soldiers and others well armed. One man unarmed standing, and he speaks to them, and they fall back. There's something extraordinary about his presence. And then he asks them again, who is it you want? Who do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus says, I told you that I'm he. I am. And then he says something very important. He says, if you're looking for me, then let these go. Let these go, pointing to the 11. Let these go. Which is exactly what no responsible Roman commander would do. Can you imagine uh, someone who's suspected of being a rebel leader and the leader says, well, you can arrest me, but I'd like you to leave, leave all the rest of my group. Let these men go. And at this point, John gives a little comment which tells us the reason for this drama. In verse 9, he says, this happens so that the words Jesus had spoken would be fulfilled I have not lost one of those you gave me. So he's, he's speaking to the fa God the Father. And you see this if you, if you look later in chapter 6, in verses 37, 38, 39 uh, of chapter 6, and chapter 6, verse 44, Jesus speaks of 
people, men, women, and children, whom the Father has given him. And the picture is that the Father has given men, women, and children to Jesus in eternity. And he said, here is a people, I want you to take them and keep them and guard them and save them and rescue them and raise them up on the last day with resurrection bodies. And in John chapter 6, Jesus says, I'm not going to lose one of them. Every single one that the Father has given me, that's what I'm going to do. In the Good Shepherd in chapter 10, he says, my Father who has given them to me. And again in his prayer in chap- chapter 17, um, uh, I protected them. None has been lost except Judas Iscariot, who's in a different category. He's not one the Father has given to Jesus. And it's an extraordinary thing that Jesus says. It's a wonderful thing to think if you're, if you're a follower of Jesus. So you think, well, I'm a follower of Jesus because at some point I put my trust in Jesus, whether as a grown-up or as a child, I put my trust in Jesus. And the Bible says you put your trust in Jesus um, at a deeper level because God the Father gave you to Jesus and entrusted you to Jesus, and Jesus committed himself that along with every other man, woman, and child who who has been given to Jesus, he will guard you, keep you, save you, and raise you up on the last day. And John says the reason this drama happened in the garden is so that we'll understand that that's true. So it's not just a story about Jesus enabling 11 frightened men to run away, which they duly did. I mean, it was a confused scene, and as we'll see in a moment, there was something of a scuffle. And Mark tells us that there was one man who was running away, and they grabbed his, his, his linen garment, which is all he had, and he had to run away starkers. <laughs> so it was a confused scene that was going on there. But it's not just the story about how Jesus enabled 11 frightened men to get away. It's a story to fix in your mind and to fix in my mind because it demonstrates graphically that the Lord Jesus will raise up on the last day every single man, woman, and child whom the Father has given to Jesus. If you belong to Jesus, if you are following Jesus, there will be times when the darkness is all around, when it seems overwhelming, it seems that there is no way out at all. Think to yourself, what happened on that evening in the garden? That's a picture of what Jesus has promised to do. He will guard you. And we grasp a little bit more about how it is that he does that uh, from verse 10. Simon Peter, who had a sword, a short sword or a long knife, he drew it. He struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. Typical eyewitness comment of someone who was there saw that it was the right ear, typical of Simon Peter, who was very brave, very, very brave, not well advised, but very brave. And he, and he, he sort of lashes out. I mean, he's not a very expert soldier, otherwise he'd do better than just cutting off an ear. Anyway, he does that. And the, a scuffle is presumably beginning to break out. And John tells us the servant's name because John, the gospel writer, knows the name of the high priest's servant, and that's going to come back to haunt Peter in next week's passage. He's recognized. And Jesus says, put your sword away. And then he says something very significant. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? The Father has given Jesus two things. The Father has given Jesus men, women, and children. He's given him people in eternity a multitude whom no man can number, an uncountable multitude of men, women, and children, everybody who will put their trust in Christ all through history, everybody who trusted in the promise of Christ to come in Old Testament days. This huge multitude the Father has given to Jesus, but he has also given him a cup. And if there was time, we could look at the Psalms or Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel or other prophets, or the book of Revelation. And you see consistently the cup is a picture of the righteous anger, the just, fair anger of God against sinners. And Jesus drinks that on behalf of his people. And he can only keep his own safe and raise them up on the last day if he drinks the cup. And so you watch in the drama, and you see one man walking into the darkness 
alone, well, with all these soldiers, but alone of that group. And you're one of the, with those 11 frightened people in the garden as you run away. And you see that one man, your master, walking into the darkness, and he will drink the cup. And then we're told just very briefly, they, 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 the detachment, the cohort with its commander, and the Jewish officials, they arrest him, they bind him, they take him to Annas, who's the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that, that year. There's lots more could be said about that, but John doesn't dwell on that. He just says, verse 14, Caiaphas is the one who has advised the Jewish leaders, this is back in verse, chapter 11, that it'd be a really good thing if one person died instead of the people, which was a political judgment. It'd be better to get rid of this troublemaker so the people won't get destroyed by the Romans. And John tells it because Caiaphas spoke better than he knew. And there's something about what Jesus is doing as he walks into the darkness, which is one man dying for the people. Now, the thing I want to try to press home to you as I've been praying that it would come home to my heart is this. If you trust in the Lord Jesus and you belong to him, and you may not think you're a very good disciple, most of us don't and most of us aren't, but you are a follower of Jesus and you belong to Jesus, God the Father has given you to Jesus. And Jesus promises that he will guard every single one the Father has given him. It's not that he's going to keep 90% or 95%. Every single one. He's not going to lose one whom the Father has given him. If you belong to Jesus, Jesus is committed that he will keep you and guard you and raise you up on the last day. It doesn't mean that disciples of Jesus don't suffer. Most of those 11 men uh, suffered, were arrested, many of them, as far as we can tell, died for their faith in Christ. They weren't ready for it yet, so Jesus doesn't let them go through that yet. They're not ready for it, but they do suffer, but he will raise them up on the last day. And it's quite a thought, isn't it, as we pray for brothers and sisters, troubled brothers and sisters in Ukraine, or other countries surrounding there, as they face sometimes terrible sufferings, that Jesus of Nazareth has promised every single one, every single man, woman, and child who belongs to Jesus, I'm not going to lose one. I will raise him up. I will raise her up on the last day, every single one. That's the point of the story. And so when you and I, as if we're followers of Jesus, we feel darkness pressing in. I don't know about you, I quite often feel darkness pressing in. It feels oppressive. Uh, 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 and there feels, it feels like there's no way out. It's really important for us to remember this. This is the promise of Jesus. And in this little small-scale drama of one man with 11 frightened men, we see in a nutshell what Jesus does with his church all through the centuries. I will not lose one. And my prayer for you, and perhaps you would pray this for me, is that when we face the overwhelming power of the world, the flesh and the devil, and we're tempted to despair in the darkness, that God will bring to our minds and our thoughts and our hearts and our imaginations the wonder of what this little drama represents and the promise of Jesus, I haven't lost one. Let's be quiet for a moment and then I'll pray. God, our Father, we thank you for the, not just the beauty and the perfection of Jesus, but we thank you for his commitment, his promise to save and his power to save. And we thank you that his, he drank the cup of your wrath uh, on behalf, not just of those 11 men, but of countless others. We thank you that he 
made good on that promise. And we pray uh, for those who don't as yet belong to Jesus that they might come to find in him the saviour they need. And for those of us who do, that we might know deeply in our hearts what a wonderful saviour he is. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen.